Ready? Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my very great uh, pleasure to be the moderator for today's discussion. Um, my name is Fiona Haynes. I'm Professor of Criminology at the Social School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Um, as is customary, I would very much like to acknowledge that today we're gathered on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung and Boomerang peoples of the Kulin Nation who have been custodians of this land for thousands and thousands of years. And we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that to any First Nations people present in the audience and online today. Um, we have got a wonderful discussion ahead, a wonderful couple of presenters. Um, there's just a couple of housekeeping points, however. We've got, um, I'm not quite sure, but there were around 150 registered online. So we've got a large online audience and I'd like to welcome those, those of you who are joining us online. Just to let you know that the chat function has been disabled. Uh, so if you could enter your questions in the Q&A function, that would be very, very helpful because we're hoping to generate an interesting and useful discussion. So what's the seminar all about? This is, this is the for, formal title, Rewiring the Social Contract for Interacting with the Grid or the Electricity Grid. I'd like to say it's a bit about fairness without crashing the electricity system as we know it. How do we make sure that those people who have solar PV on those ro their roofs, batteries, coming to electric cars, how can we make sure that both the benefits and the costs are equally shared, taking into account the technical needs of the system itself? So we're trying to sort of engender, if you like, a very particular part of what our social scientists like to call a just transition. We have two excellent speakers today. I'm not going to uh, uh, give you their full bios. I've got their permission for you to access those online and in the uh, flyer for the seminar. We're going to have each speaker speak for about 25 minutes and then quick clarification questions before we come back to, together for our discussion and our Q&A. So I'm going to introduce both speakers before so that we can have a, a, a seamless shift between them. Our first speaker is Dr. Niraj Lal, Principal at AEMO, and visiting fellow at ANU. And I think you've got a visiting fellowship at MEI as well, or an association with MEI as well. Not at this, oh, okay, I spoke out of turn. All right. Um, our second speaker is Pierluigi Mancarella, who's the chair professor of electrical power systems at the University of Melbourne in Australia, but also Professor of Smart Energy Systems at the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, before we start, we thought it'd be helpful to know a bit about you, the audience. So I've just got a couple of very quick questions. And if you're listening online, if your answer is yes, if you can just uh, give us an emoji, that, that'd be great so we can get a sense of the online audience as well. How many or who in the audience has rooftop solar? About a third. How many of you have rooftop solar with a battery? Interesting. Okay, there's a few more, few more online. How many of you have an electric vehicle? One two, a couple there, and a few more online. How many of you have all three? Okay. So 
the vast majority or the majority of people in the room neither have solar PV nor do they have batteries and certainly not electric cars. Each of those technologies are very, very important to the transition, but there are some consequences of that. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, let Naraj come to the microphone. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's coming up. The, um, slides. I don't know. Cool. Okay. Oh, did that work? Yeah. Okay. Easy. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks very much, Fiona, for the introduction. Uh, my name's Nietzsche. I'll be speaking about a DER bill of rights and responsibilities, maybe closer to the microphone here. Um, rights and responsibilities. And the aim is to support distributed energy resources, solar panels, electric cars, and more, to contribute to lower electricity costs for all customers in a way that feels fair for both owners and non-owners. I'd like to add my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on tonight and pay my respects to elders. There's a lot we can learn about sustainability and reciprocity from the people who have lived on this land for tens of thousands of years. And look forward to the continuing the conversation. <clears throat> Tonight, I'll be providing a bit of context on the issues of DER, acronym, uh, reviewing current status and international considerations before presenting the initial thinking behind a bill um, authored by a colleague, Lee Brown, and myself with some thoughts about possible pathways and next steps. A lot of this work touches on questions of social and political science, which is why it's so lovely to have Fiona moderating tonight. But I have a confession to make, which is that my background is not in social science, it's in physics, uh, and more particularly, solar energy, which I reckon is just great. <clears throat> began working on solar cells uh, in 2006 at a time when global prices were rising due to the global shortage of polysilicon. You can see that with this graph here. Solar panel prices versus cumulative shipments showing the learning curve for PV with prices decreasing about 20% every doubling of shipments at about every three years since 1970. It's a log, log graph, so things are moving really fast. I published my first research article in 2007 with my honours supervisor, Andrew Blakers, and you can see that prices started decreasing even more rapidly since then. I'd like to say that you're all very welcome. Didn't know that my research would have the dramatic impact on global prices that it did, but I'm glad that it has. Uh, Surprise too that my PhD research had the same and some subsequent work too. Now that I'm in Melbourne, who knows where the price will end up? The floor is the limit. Stoking, this is nothing more than some shameless self-promotion and it's not the last of it in the talk, if I'm being honest, but I've included the hashtag shameless um, uh, wherever it happens to make it less cringeworthy. We'll see if it works. Just reckon PV prices are decreasing really fast, exponentially so. Solar panels are now selling for less than $40 per metre squared. It's about the cost of marine grade plywood and still falling. This has resulted in exponential increases in PV installations around the world. There's now more solar uh, capacity installed globally than nuclear, soon to be more than hydro, gas, and coal in the coming decade. Even if the capacity factors aren't like for like, more solar was installed last year than anything else, likely to continue for decades to come. In Australia, 2.3 gigawatts of solar was installed, uh, of large scale renewables were installed last year, 2.7 gigawatts of rooftop solar. That is, more rooftop solar is being connected than large scale renewables, again, likely to continue for the coming decade. This is changing the grid and really quickly. This is a graph of the national electricity market from this week. Uh, at various times, rooftop solar has accounted for around 40% of total generation with renewables peaking at around 70%. These values are increasing uh, each quarter. This is a graph from South Australia last year. The light yellow is provided by rooftop solar. It's possible that 100% of South Australia's uh, demand will be met by rooftop solar uh, alone very soon. The record low for demand was just five megawatts a few weeks ago. More solar PV is being installed in Australia per capita than any other country, and it's starting to impact grid security and market dynamics. Prices were negative <clears throat> for more than half of all daylight hours in South Australia and Victoria in the past two quarters. The projection is that rooftop solar is expected to supply 70 to 80% of total NEM mainland demand within three years. And curtailment is becoming more commonplace too. Voltage rises on the distribution network are uh, leading to automatic curtailment of solar PV systems across Australia. A recent study by Naomi Stringer estimated the loss in revenue of PV generation of $1 to $4 million in South Australia in one year alone. This penetration has resulted in new functional requirements established really recently. AMO 
has implemented new minimum system load procedures, which in the last instance leads to disconnection of PV systems. There's an article out today, which is uh, talking about the, the challenges of this. It's already been used in anger in South Australia last year. It's being rolled out in other jurisdictions now. There are increasing reports of customers being limited in ability to export to two kilowatts, one kilowatts, no kilowatts at all. Flexible export limits will assist with this. Pierre Luigi will speak later um, about how these might may be coordinated in more detail. But a DER dominated grid will likely require at least emergency disconnection capability, export curtailment, visibility and forecasts of operation and more, particularly if algorithms are involved. There's a lot of work being done right now, urgently in AMO and in partnership with DNSPs. Dr. Jenny Reese, manager of DER operations at AMO is leading the world on a number of critical operational challenges, such as under frequency load shedding, cybersecurity, operational forecasting, and a bunch of other issues regarding operational coordination of high amounts of DER. But there are emerging questions of fairness too. When volt watt curtailment happens, it doesn't just decrease the export of a PV system, but its total output, meaning that when voltages are high, customers aren't even able to self-consume the electricity they're generating from their own rooftop. That's not fair. But it's also not fair when solar owners get paid to export electricity when prices are negative, nor is it fair if distribution businesses have to build a network to accommodate everyone's solar exports all of the time and for non-solar owners to pay for this majority of people in this room. How can customers be involved in this conversation? The regulatory environment wasn't really designed for high DER penetration. It's really rapidly trying to catch up. I won't go through all of the reports in detail, but decisions are being made now about emergency backstop measures, PV, uh, control measures, solar export charges, dynamic operating envelopes, a lot. Uh, perhaps most relevant is the Australian Energy Market Commission's recently updated access and pricing arrangements for DER. And there are current rule changes on integrating price responsive resources into the NEM, EV registers, flexible trader arrangements. Uh, Nicole Dodd is the manager of DER and retail reform at AMO, leading AMO's interaction with these. A number of world first reforms have been proposed by AMO and others and are currently under consideration. But in addition to wholesale market integration, some simple questions remain unanswered. What should a customer's right be to self-consume the electricity they've generated with their own panels? What obligations should accompany customers who want to make money in energy markets? How should networks allocate export capability to customers? How should networks accommodate fast charges for EVs? Who should pay for them? How much should non-DER owners bear the costs of network build? AMO's integrated system plan highlights a very significant opportunity for coordinated distributed uh, distribution storage and assets, but there's a growing awareness that this is coming online at a much lower rate than previously assumed. There's a real opportunity here um, if we can get the get the ideas of fairness right. The current status is that solar owners get paid to export electricity when prices are negative, and it's often known non-solar owners that bear a disproportionate cost for this. All good? <coughs> Decision makers can continue with the status quo framework of feed-in tariffs, network build, ad hoc curtailment, third-party aggregation, and retail products, but there's also an opportunity to support DER, to contribute to lower system costs for all, including non-DER owners. This will require a new social contract, which in some way must evolve with high DER penetration. From the implicit plug and play connection established in the 19th century, to the subsidies and feed-in tariffs of the 2000s, rapid tariff decreases and regular DER curtailment happening now and increasing in the coming decades. Germany and Switzerland led the world in the establishment of a feed-in tariff for PV in the early 2000s, with huge success in kickstarting the global solar industry. But in doing so, they established the precedent of an electricity user as a market participant, without any other obligation than to connect their resources, which isn't quite suited to an energy market that at times is dominated by rooftop solar. In this world, those expectations may need to evolve. What might this new social contract look like? Initial consideration has been enacted in the US. New York enshrined the rights for homeowners to connect rooftop solar. California attempted a really far reaching bill of rights, but the final bill removed all references to solar. The state that's gone the furthest is Nevada, which enshrined rights to generate, consume, store, and export renewable energy to receive fair credit for exports. These rights are helpful to enshrine customer access to have and use PV, but they're not quite appropriate for grids that can be dominated at times by DER. For context, Nevada has 400 megawatts of solar in a 12 gigawatt grid, 
South Australia has one and a half gigawatts of solar in a three and a half gigawatt grid. It's 12 times the penetration. With this level of DER penetration rapidly being replicated across the country and the world eventually, a different paradigm of interaction is required for grid security considerations alone and also for equity. It's important to ask here, who gets to decide and who is actually listening to people? There's a wealth of research out there, both on actual customers' views, but also showing how poorly reform processes of the past decade have actually engaged with customers. Some views are included here from leading energy social science researchers. I'll let you read them for a little bit. Yeah, people participating in markets with their DER is bonkers. Market structures are patently unable to resolve issues of equity. Bureaucrats have been sadly distracted by ideas like VPPs and shiny innovation talk. I think I've been one of those bureaucrats. Um, we had an MEI workshop on the question of DER social contracts last month with participation from policymakers, networks, customer representatives, and academics from various parts of Australia. And there was a common recognition of the challenges in this space. Everything from the nature of the regulatory environment, not quite set up to manage the energy transition of this order of magnitude, to the profit requirements of network businesses and the binary separation of the contestable services, to the emission of the concept of equity in the national energy objective. The challenges are both structural, instrumental, with a range of possible reforms proposed inside and outside the current regulatory environment. Further information on this will be outlined in the forthcoming white paper that Peter Lujo and I are preparing. It's part of the, the much bigger picture of the energy transition. What we present here is perhaps a first attempt at ideation within the human-centered design approach of what a new DER social contract might look like, building on the work of social science researchers across the sector to have a crack at what a fair or acceptable approach might look like. It's not to presume that we know what all customers want nor what everyone will think is fair, but to start that conversation. And our starting point is a representative customer from a low income household, with English, English as a second language, distrustful of energy companies, not on the cheapest tariff, unlikely to switch. When the appropriate time comes to engage with the full spectrum of customers and representatives more generally, there's a wealth of literature on there, on, out there on how to do this in the most appropriate, respectful and empowering way. We certainly advocate for this. A recognitional and procedural justice principles require participation at the start of the process, not the end. What, what we present here is a first step and the public lecture tonight is perhaps the beginning of that conversation too. Having given that introduction, I'll start with an analogy uh, for the bill between solar panels and apple trees. It's not the first horticultural reference I'm aware of. I know Jill Caney uses apples and Mike Davidson from Ops Forecasting uses tomatoes. Other people uses le use lemons. But being homegrown is the key idea here. That is with an apple tree, you should have guaranteed rights to eat your own apples, make crumble, cider, whatever you like. Uh, selling apples for profit comes with the responsibility to not carry coddling moth. Um, to ensure pesticides are appropriately washed off, amongst other things. Prices depend on the availability of trucks and local market value. It's tricky if you live in an apple district, no, no one wants your apples. Maybe you or our government could pay more for trucks for everyone to be able to sell apples all the time, but it probably wouldn't be efficient or fair. No worries to share or store your apples with the local co-op if you can wheelbarrow them down there. The main distinction is between growing for yourself and selling for profit. But the analogy obviously falls apart somewhere. Apples aren't an essential service. Supply demand doesn't have to be balanced every second, but perhaps fundamental principles remain the same, especially for a future where apple trees and warehouses are absolutely everywhere. It's not clear why solar PV electrons being sold for profit should be guaranteed market access by governments any more than apples being sold for profit. If anything, with electricity as an essential service, there's an opportunity for distribution to consider efficiency and social justice principles more fully. With this analogy in mind and the principle give a little to get a little, we propose a bill of rights and responsibilities uh, as first crack with the aim that customers can have confidence that core rights won't be breached in any reform initiative without everyone needing detailed technical or regulatory knowledge about each of the reforms that are taking place. <clears throat> uh, the rights are constructed around high level principles of customer interaction and they are to support system security and reliability with high DER penetration as a given. To preserve the precedent of fair access to energy use by reasonable passive ways, we'll talk about that in a tick. To allow the self-use, self-generated electricity, to outline that additional obligations might accompany activities that interact with energy markets for profit. That resources be treated symmetrically with large-scale resources where possible and efficient. Customers have a right to privacy, access to fair share of value from their energy data. That passive options be set as the default for DER. And finally, to be written simply in plain 
uh, language to allow broad customer engagement. Full details of these principles and the bill itself is available in the paper, um, but I'll introduce the framework of the bill here. Uh, we distinguish rights and responsibilities for passive and active participation for each activity of consumption, generation, storage, and data. I'll go through the first area in a little more detail for energy consumption. The key distinction here, I won't go through all the text, but I'll talk about the themes. The key distinction here is that the historical precedent is preserved. It's a right to fair use by normal loads. That's passive interaction. So if you're plugging in a toaster or a hairdryer or a dialysis machine, you shouldn't be required to go through a third party aggregator or provide forecasts. These are classified passive loads that don't participate actively. The distinction is where a customer wants to make money from the active control of a load. Then there might be obligations, which could include additional tech standards, registration, allowing remote control for credible system security risks, providing good faith scheduling information. Alongside this, there should be a principle that active loads are treated and remunerated symmetrically with large scale loads where possible and efficient, and that there should remain a right to switch active loads back to passive settings. With a caveat, that there might be some loads, uh, depending on threshold kilowatt or kilowatt hour values, that might be required to be actively connected. High power EV charging points might be one example. Interesting uh, emerging rights, we don't include this in the paper, uh, but perhaps worth consideration include the right to resilience. So 99% of all PV systems in Australia that are out there couldn't even charge your phone in a blackout. It's a little bit ridiculous, mine included. Uh, this is very possible with some newer inverters and perhaps might be considered a requirement for a more resilient future. There's also a question about the controllability of electric vehicles that are internet connected. Might all Tesla drivers be subject to the whim of Elon Musk, who could remotely shut them down via an online upgrade and similarly for other EV manufacturers? This is an interesting question and significantly different from petrol cars, perhaps deserves more consideration. Similarly is the right to repair, enshrined last year in Australia for all motor vehicles and this year in the EU for all technically repairable products. Again, topics for future consideration. We continue with a distinction between passive and active engagement for each of the areas of generation, storage, and data. For generation, the key right is to be able to self-consume, self-generated electricity, eat your own apples. With curtailment of self-consumption to occur rarely, perhaps tied to the reliability standard for unserved energy. But if you're selling electricity for profit, then there are possible additional obligations for things such as additional tech capability, registration, forecast position, uh, provision, flexible export with symmetric treatment as far as possible with large-scale generation. Rooftop solar is already the largest generator in a number of regions. Some of these responsibilities are um, already starting to be incorporated in dynamic operating envelopes and flexible export limits. With storage, we outline uh, the distinction between storing only self-generated energy versus storing grid electricity for later use and export. We propose rights and responsibilities with data also, including the right to privacy, the right to access, the right to fair share and the value of third party licensing, and the right to revoke consent of the use of energy data. And finally, we propose that passive options should be set as the default for DER, that active options should only be enabled where there's net benefit to the customer, with information and choice, and that there's a right to revert to passive settings, which might serve as the default in the event of loss of communication, compliance, or cybersecurity compromise. It's an increasing concern for AMO as the system operator. We suggest a possible benefit of this approach maybe to allocate a duty of care for retailers and third-party aggregators to act in the interests of customers and for networks to aim to minimize costs for all customers when integrating active to ER participation. In our paper, following the presentation of the bill, we consider some implementation pathways. The most robust recognition is through legislative instruments. But there are non-legislative pathways too, including via reform of current instruments. One example is the inclusion of a self-consumption mode, self-generated energy through the Australian standard for grid-connected inverters previously sat on the EL 04203 committee, it's really the technical committee, for the review of the standard. And this clause was proposed by an engineer in Queensland, Pete Kilby, to support PV consumption, even if network voltages are high. The idea can be expressed clearly, mathematically seen in this graph, voltage on the X axis, axis <clears throat> output on the Y, and the current standard reduces total PV output when voltages are high, even when there's a customer load present. With a new clause in the standard, this could be avoided, that's the shaded region. And the court didn't get up, mostly due to resourcing and governance arrangements for standards, but should be considered closely for a DER-dominated future. The opt-in flexible export approach is perhaps one of the most practical avenues for adoption in the first instance, expanding it to include consumption and forecasting. Other instruments include network connection agreements, the DER register, flexible trader arrangements, current AEMC reforms, there's so much out there. 
Following this, the bill could be considered by jurisdiction and policy makers, potentially through a formal industry stakeholder engagement program. A clear implementation pathway does exist and likely would support expedited form of DER regulation. To conclude, DER is already comprising the majority of generation at times in some regions, already leading to urgent system security considerations and curtailment. Regulatory reforms are underway in response to the breadth and technical detail of each is limiting progress in customer endorsement. We present a DER Bill of Rights and Responsibilities to support participation with a DER dominated electricity grid with guiding principles for passive, reasonable engagement with electricity and with fair allocation of responsibilities and benefits with active participation for profit. These rights aren't limited in scope to household scale resources. DER is being deployed at various scales throughout the grid uh, the bill is constructed without arbitrary distinction of resource size. We highlight how various elements might be implemented through existing standards and processes and how some rights are already being breached. Finally, we outline possible pathways to enshrinement of these rights in a legislative instrument. The aim is that simple espousal of these rights in plain English will support customers and their advocates to trust regulatory reform processes which abide by the bill and in doing so support swift, broadly endorsed, vital energy sector reform by providing clarity on the guardrails of DER interaction. Further information is available in the research article, conversation article, and on a radio national discussion I had on the topic recently with Alan Finkel. <coughs> Jake uh, the bill itself is published under Creative Commons license for further use and free adaptation by other jurisdictions. I'd like to acknowledge a few people in particular for the presentation. That's Lee Brown, co-author of the paper and specialist in electricity retail markets. He's worked in the sector for over 20 years and provided much perspective for DER integration. And I'd like to thank uh, Heather Bronson Cooper and Laura Jones at the ANU for kindly, if bluntly, pointing me to the vast amount of work that a lot of wonderful researchers have been doing in the social science space. I'd finally also actually like to pay tribute to Ariel Liebman, uh, the former director of the Monash Energy Institute, who passed away unexpectedly last week after a brief illness. Ariel was really passionate and energetic about the energy transition for this work. He was kind enough to connect me with researchers at Monash, <clears throat> through which I was be able to uh, learn more deeply from the digital energy futures work of your land, strangers and team. Ariel will be missed. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for your time. And I'll hand you back over to Fiona. Just just don't run away too quickly. Sure. Um, join me in thanking Nish very much indeed. Um, at this point, I just wondered if there are any clarification questions. This area is full of acronyms and complexities. And for some of you, it's probably a piece of cake. For some of you, it may not be. And no question is a stupid question at this point. So does anybody have any points or any anything they'd wish to clarify or they didn't quite understand in uh, Niraj's presentation? before we go to the next. Now I've tried to access the q and Just see if any of these are, oh, no. <laughs> None of those seem relevant at this point. Hang on a second. No clarification questions? Great. Well, we'll move to our next uh, presentation from Professor Mancarella. If you'd like to come forward. All right. So I think good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, great, great to be here. You know, great to talk after news. You know, there was like fantastic, uh, fantastic intro actually to to the issue. So what I will do here is a little bit uh, of I will take you probably back to some fundamental principles, just because I want to make sure that everyone is on the same page when we, we deal with this huge complexity that somehow this was, was showing. And then I will have um, instead a little bit of a deep dive into some of the work that we did uh, in Project Edge. There's one of the most uh, somehow advanced uh, uh, projects in the world looking at uh, the development of distributed energy systems. And of course, then the role of the DR and somehow um, social considerations around uh, DR. So uh, why are we doing this? Uh, somehow maybe uh, like obvious, uh, but just to remind to everyone that if you look at what we have in Australia today and what we have uh, over the next uh, few years already is basically corresponding to having 
rooftop PV as the largest generator in Denem and distributing energy systems, including um, battery storage at homes, somehow massive dispatchable power plant. So it is unthinkable to, to, to imagine a future system where the largest generator and the largest dispatchable generator actually is not part of uh, um, a, a, an ecosystem, does not follow rules as effectively other generators and how historically we have done to maintain at least system security is not uh, because of economic efficiency, as I'm going to, um, to show you. How have we done things in the past? So it was pretty simple. The um, power system was a very linear system that has been uh, developed and operated uh, for about under 30 years in this way. There were a bunch of uh, large scale generators, a few hundreds in, in different uh, states or countries. And uh, they were providing effectively flexibility, system control, system services, and reliability uh, to an inflexible demand. So effectively, you would do what is called predict and provide. You would try, try to predict what demand would do in a very simple way, and then generators would do everything else. Very, very simple. And all the control in the system was in the hands of a few large-scale generators. What is happening in the, in the transition? What will happen in the future? Well, lots of complexity. The system is no longer linear because, first of all, you have lots of renewables, uh, large-scale renewables in the system they may actually be not so flexible, actually rather the opposite. They are calling for more and more flexibility because of their variability and uh, uncertainty. So who will provide this flexibility the moment that conventional generators will no longer be there? Obviously, at the same time, there will be lots of distributing resources appearing to the system, particularly in cases like, uh, again, Australia, and uh, all of this uh, got the potential to be controllable and dispatchable. It is only natural to think that this uh, uh, distributed resources would eventually contribute to the um, active management of the local network and, of course, of the whole system in terms of system balance, both for economic purposes, but also for security and more generally reliability purposes. That is why we talk about these ideas of virtual power plants, so aggregation of distributed energy resources to particip participate in system operation and market operation. That's why we talk about community energy systems, energy communities, again, aggregation of resources, be able to interact with the rest of the system, and eventually microgrids potentially also be able to um, isolate themselves from the rest of the grid, particularly for um, reliability purposes. So when you look at this evolution, Again, you can imagine that very soon we will see all these distributed resources actually providing flexibility and system services to the rest of the grid. Now, and, and this is also why we have in there highlighted a DSO, so-called distribution system operator. There's an entity that somehow would have to manage this very active grid that is very different from the old distribution network operator that somehow was only uh, taking care of like the maintenance of the grid rather than the active operation of the grid. So this is the future that we're looking at. Now under this, under this future, again, it's, it's pretty unthinkable uh, that, that uh, somehow we keep operating all our resources in a relatively passive way and we do not uh, follow somehow more fundamental principles, so, um, you know, like, like some, some kind of rights and responsibilities as Nish uh, would, uh, would, would put it. But let me tell you a little bit more in terms of what, why technically we, we must do this, otherwise we just can't operate the system. Because I fear that when, when, we, when we see lots of articles and lots of, lots of comments, lots of uh, uh, you know, LinkedIn stuff going on, I'm, I just fear that actually, the fundamentals are not are not there, so I would really like to be on 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 on, on same page with uh, with with everyone. So, first of all, they may be very basic, but uh, just just in case. Now, obviously, th this network has not been built for distributed generation. This network has not been built to actually uh, absorb the power that is generated locally. 
Uh, and this is, uh, you know, because historically we, we did not have the technology to be able to do that. So the moment you start putting lots of solar PV in a network, the sun shines for everyone and everyone starts injecting power in the network. The network has not been built to actually absorb this simultaneous power together. That is why we end up with some form of constraints that in many cases can be uh, thermal constraints, in other cases, mo most cases, would be voltage constraints. So voltage go up and eventually you might have to disconnect PV to maintain uh, the, 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 the integrity of, uh, um, of the network. So you have this uh, overloading of transformers potentially or very high voltage in general that you need to, um, you, you need to uh, somehow manage. And one idea of managing this is to eventually put some limitation. Now, how you achieve this technically is a different matter, but somehow you must come up with some limitations, some local constraints to the injections of power into the grid, eventually not to overload or, or, or cause issues um, to any of the network asset. So that's why if you look at this um, um, very simple diagram, looking at the value that you could release from distributed resources, versus the level of sophistication that you need to, 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 to develop uh, in the network, you end up with uh, a system like this, where at minimum, you need to have some form of passive energy export limit, because otherwise, uh, as I said, you will not be able to actually maintain network security. And this is the so-called uh, ex export, uh, uh, export limits that uh, somehow uh, well, but there's also an input limit that we discussed about. Let's, let's look at export limits. They're somehow fixed the same for everyone and kind of mythical five kilowatt export limits, same for everyone. Now, how efficient is, uh, um, is, is all of this? Now, moving forward, you can think that uh, actually you can start thinking a more intelligent way of uh, um, doing things, including the fact that these export, export limits can become more sophisticated, particularly dynamic, depending on the specific uh, uh, system and network requirements. And these are the so-called dynamic operating envelopes that effectively are same as uh, uh, export limits. Again, just looking at the, the injection of power to network. However, they may change with time and they may change with location. So effectively, all customers would have different limits at uh, different times, depending on the characteristic of the networks and potentially also some uh, um, economic requirements. However, in here, the physics of the system is essential. We cannot neglect the physics because no physics will always beat economics and any other consideration. So it is essential when we calculate these limits that again, we consider the, 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 the physical principles of, of the networks and with that, the fact that where some distributed resource is located in particular and how big the resource is will make a huge impact on how much power can be pumped into uh, the system. Now, this, this, this dynamic operating envelopes, dynamic uh, network limits effectively are needed to support both network operation, secure network operation, uh, again, to avoid the overload your transformers or too high voltages, but also system security functionalities, like you know, some examples that Nish was, was, was highlighting. Why, why do we need that? Again, we need to go back to try to understand that the system has been designed to, to actually operate uh, somehow with this kind of uh, uh, linear, linear fashion. And the very first uh, installation we did for the stranger resources were a kind of fit and forget product. Just put this stranger resources, you put and the solar panels there, and then let them inject power into the system, give them feeding tariffs, you know, like, like uh, Germany was pioneering, as, as Nish mentioned, and then don't do, don't do anything else. Like the, the, the rest of the system will manage that. The market will manage that, the system, the system operator will balance that. But this is only because the, the penetration level was very, very small. But now we are in a situation where, again, this has become the largest generator in the NEM, and it will keep being the largest generator in the NEM. So what are the implications of keeping doing things in uh, the same way? Well, eventually, you have, uh, uh, you basically have it today, this kind of disconnect between resources that are connected to a transmission level, they are dispatchable, 
and controllable by the system operator. And then you have these resources that are in the distribution networks that are effectively non-dispatchable and non-controllable, which means uh, that the system operator actually, when it needs to guarantee system security, particularly in case there is a loss of a generator, well, effectively, if the larger generator is embedded in the distribution network and is not visible to it, it cannot guarantee system security. So if uh, like distributed PV would trip off and cause a major event, actually system operator basically is not capable to protect the system against that in the same way as you could uh, when, for example, there was a coal power plant or a, a, a gas power plant tripping off in transmission system, because again, as by participation in the market, by the ability to scale the system or that, there is a clear understanding of what's going on in the system. So when we have, when we hear issues such as uh, we, we have problems with minimum demand, because this operator cannot operate the system with minimum demand, therefore we need to curtail, for example, rooftop PV and somehow increase the level of minimum demand. This is the reason, because effectively, with the, without having visibility and controllability, there are things that can happen there that uh, the system operator cannot, cannot, cannot protect uh, against. And this is not uh, theory, because I mean, you, you, this is like the, the actual headline of the, from ABC News in 2020, you will remember the situation where effectively uh, the system operator, when South Australia went uh, uh, and uh, demanded uh, effectively for the first time that uh, rooftop PV would be disconnected. Why would it do, uh, would it do so? Because once South Australia goes and landed, and there is lots of distributed PV, uh, again, basically the, the last generator in uh, um, South Australia, because the system operator does not have direct visibility and controllability of that, if uh, you have lots of tripping of PV for various reasons, uh, that you know, can be like various forms of instability in the system, effectively that can cause issues against, uh, that, that, that system operator cannot protect the system. I guess. So the best option is actually to curtail PV to avoid the potential trip for that. So this is all done for system security because if it doesn't do that and something happens, well, the result will be a blackout, another blackout. So we need to be, to understand this, that this is all done in the interest of the security reliability of the whole system. And it's not done because, for example, AIMO doesn't like uh, uh, so, so that could be honest. I think no, we, we need to be very clear because otherwise we, 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 we do not un understand uh, that uh, there is really an intersection here of social, technical, and uh, uh, economic aspects. All of this is a consequence of the fact that the R is not visible, dispatchable, controllable. So everything that we are building technically and commercially is actually aimed at developing this visibility, dispatchability and controllability that is in the interest of everyone, including in particular of the DR owners. Because moving forward, what we happen is that if we manage to develop this system scale with the right platforms and the right commercial frameworks, you will end up in a situation where effectively there will be a full uh, interaction between distributing energy resources and the rest of the system, the rest of the market with potential more benefits, including for distributed resources, than we would see today, besides the benefits for the overall system. Now, whether this will happen by aggregators or not, it's a matter of system design. But in the long term, however, there is a certainly the opportunity of providing all this system flexibility from distributed resources to the rest of, of the grid. So somehow we're shifting from a case where we need to protect almost the system from a very deep penetration of DR to a situation where all DR will be uh, deployed positively to provide system flexibility to support system operation. Of course, with that, there will be economic benefits coming from DR customers because now they will be able to access new revenue streams, for example, that at the moment they cannot access. But this all needs to be enabled by all these uh, uh, right, uh, um, right, right mechanisms. Now, what are these right mechanisms? Again, it's somehow they all require that there is an understanding that the injection of power into a network needs to be limited to maintain network security and overall system security. Now, how, how do I do this in practice? 
how do I quantify what is the network lens could be? This is not trivial at all. And it's not trivially trivial technically. It's not certainly trivial. When you look into the economics of this, you start looking into also social aspects. And this is exactly what we try to do in, uh, uh, in Project Edge. Try to answer uh, questions like this. How should capacity, network capacity, be allocated to DR? Should this uh, allocation be fair? And uh, how, how is this capacity allocation um, uh, aligned with national energy objective, for example? And of course, we started thinking, what is fairness and what is it? Who really knows uh, what, 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 what is it? Well, if you look at uh, the, the national energy objective, they talk about economic efficiency. There is nothing about fairness, at least explicitly talking about fairness, right? Of course, no, also recently there are developers talking about emission reduction objectives that will be added to, um, to, to the new. Now, when you look at then this capacity allocation, even if it's not in the, in the new, do we still need to be fair to customers to maintain somehow some form of social license? Well, if yes, let's try to define this fairness. Because again, when we looked into a technical definition to calculate things, not to discuss philosophically, but actually to be fair quantitatively to different customers, this is not, uh, it was not a trivial task. Because again, when you talk about uh, fairness, are you talking about fairness for who has got uh, PV and is actively participating to the market, for example, by aggregators? Are you talking about who's got PV, but actually they're not doing anything other than injecting power into network, network maybe with uh, fixed expo limits? Why are you talking for all customers, including those customers that do not have uh, uh, PV uh, or, or, or anything uh, at all, and are not even in the network, just they are part of, uh, uh, of, of the system? So how do we do this uh, in a way that is, you know, like engineering uh, sound, so somehow in a quantitative uh, way. So what we did uh, in the project, and this can become a little bit technical, but I want to do this just to give you the idea that it's not just a philosophical conversation. It's like you, you need someone needs to put numbers here to keep running the system and, and understand the economics of the system. And again, this is not trivial. So when you, you imagine there is a network, what you could do is you could try to have all the resources come into a network and you try to maximize all the power that is sold to the rest of the system, for example, to participate in the energy market. Or someone could decide, for example, that the resource that is renewable uh, has got uh, um, uh, more rights to inject power than, for example, a source that is not renewable. You could have in the network a solar PV, but you could also have a diesel generator. And then you can decide, uh, for example, by some form of wage allocation, the diesel generator should actually be allowed to inject less, to access less capacity. And then you start thinking of different ways by which you want to be fair in a way, in the way that you assign how much capacity you can give to different resources. You can do it, for example, by proportional allocation. So say, I just give a certain percentage of the size of different resources. So if I am bigger, I get more, if I'm smaller, I get proportionally. Or you say, actually, if I have to lose some capacity that I cannot use, I want this capacity to be the same for all resources. Or I want to use some kind of proxy for equity and for equality. And somehow say, I want to, to, be, to, to be able to access the same capacity, net capacity, for example, in, 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 in Kilowatt as uh, everyone else, I mean, you know, there, there are some tiny details you know, that differentiate equity and equality. I'm, I'm not going to discuss this uh, too much. But again, this, and these are just, these are not all, these are just some of the potential ideas to explore that. Now, when you look in practice and to try to make some calculations, what happens is that if you, if you see, for example, here, that, uh, that there is here a 10 kilowatt resource close to the head of the feeder, and a five kilowatt resource, so a small resource at the end of the feeder. When you try to inject power into the rest of the grid, the closer you are to the head of the feeder, the more physically you are actually in a good position 
to do this. So when you look at uh, maximizing the surfaces, try to export as much as you can, then a natural allocation would be try to give as much capacity as you can to the big uh, um, DR here at the beginning of the feeder, and basically don't give anything to the capacity to the DR that is at the end of the feeder, because that will be just constrained by normal network limitations. When you say, well, I want to allocate uh, now capacity according to some rules, okay, then you do whatever you want, and then you end up with some kind of unallocated capacity that here is uh, indicated in orange. And then you say, well, I want to do proportional allocation, for example, 80% to all, to all those different uh, DR proportionally to their capacity. And then I say, I want uh, an equal unallocation. So for example, if I cannot allocate two kilowatts, I want to make sure this two kilowatts is the same for everyone. And then I want to somehow try to allocate similar levels to everyone that in, in an intuitive way will look like pretty fair. Now, visually, you can see that more blue means you are able to sell more power somehow to the rest of the system. And uh, more orange means that you are more constrained. Effectively, you are preventing the network to participate in the market and potentially making money in, uh, uh, in, in the market. So when we look at then the way of quantifying this, let's say, okay, we look at this different uh, allocation methodology that technically we call objectives. You know, and these are all of these plus uh, somehow these static limits that I introduced at the beginning. And then you say, well, there are a few that seem intuitively more fair than others, because somehow they try to allocate things in a more equitable way, although still kind of uh, defined only in an intuitive way, because then you need to be much, much more specific, uh, as I was trying to say. And then you say, well, how do we assess then technically what this means uh, in terms of in practical terms for a network for the systems. We need to introduce some metrics. Some of these metrics can be technical metrics. For example, if I have a network and I can use more of this network, certainly that's good. If I can use more of capacity of DR or more capacity of renewables, certainly that is all good. But then there are metrics that can be social, effectively how well you know, somehow, uh, uh, and how fairly has uh, this uh, uh, capacity been uh, distributed? And then there's also some economic metric to say, well, actually, if I look at overall social welfare, what, uh, what am I going to achieve with the different uh, uh, allocation of uh, uh, capacity? So and just to be clear, just to give you somehow an idea of how mathematically this can be formulated, I'm not showing the maths, <laughs> don't, don't worry, but you know, this, this matrix can be defined mathematically and say, what is the quality of service? It actually means that everyone is entitled to have capacity allocated, but to be fair, I should get similar capacity as my neighbors. In addition, the more capacity we get collectively, the fair the system is. So this is the quality of service metric that we can be defined mathematically. Then there is a quality of experience, they say, as long as everyone is impacted similarly, then it's fair. Even if there is massive curtailment, I don't care, as long as we are all curtailed. And then there is a so-called min-max mean, fairness that say that the difference between winners and losers should be as small as possible. Well, then we start looking to the maths, we start uh, doing all the calculations. And what uh, we found out is that the more you use intuitive concepts of fairness and equal allocation of that, the more actually you prevent all those technical metrics and economic efficiency metrics to perform well. So the more you allocate, you allocate things in a kind of equal way, the more you impact on technical performance and economic performance. Then the more actually you have uh, like DR in the system. So the deeper the penetration is, the worse it is because the system becomes more congested. And that's when you need actually to allocate uh, capacity in a very intelligent uh, um, way. So eventually what happens is uh, that uh, by trying to be fair to a few 
customers, and you're trying to do this again in an intuitive way, you start harming not only those same customers, we look at them collectively, but the overall social welfare of all the wider pool of customers in the network and in the system. Why in the system? Because if you look at a kind of Mickey Mouse representation of how the national energy market works, in fact, you have, this is your demand and this is your supply curve of different generators. The moment that you start having energy coming from the demand side, from distributing the resources, this is equivalent to shifting the demand curve towards the left. And now the new price intersection is at much lower, which means that the more power you can actually inject into the market from distributing energy, uh, from distributing energy resources. So effectively, this is kind of corresponding to negative demand. That is why that, that curve is shifting. The more overall you can reduce prices in the market. But you reduce prices in the market for everyone, not only for for, for the DR producers. That is why it's essential that actually we enable as much power as possible getting out of DR. So we try to maximize the export for DR because this has got a, an impact for all the customers in the NEM because it greatly reduces the energy prices for all the customers in the NEM. So what actually is happening with DR locally, how you are, you are constraining that? at scale is impacting all the customers, including the ones without the R. So that's, you know, somehow, I think there is quite some important food for thought. One is that there is, as I said, negative correlation between fairness metrics and techno-economic metrics. Increasing fairness may reduce capacity and as the, the capacity that is allocated to the R and for how much power can be exported and overall the social welfare of both the local network and the whole system, then somehow you end up with socially unfair outcomes for everyone, for the community, which somehow would seem opposite to new efficiency and emission reduction principles, because this would also have as a consequence higher curtailment of renewables. So increasing system efficiency somehow would seem like a better understanding of the concept of fairness for all customers in general, not only for the uh, customers. And all of this clearly require a new social contract because it's really complicated. I think we only scratched the surface. And in order to make sense of this, we really need to, to sit together and do the right engineering, the, the right economics, the right uh, social, social considerations to, to, to move forward in a proper way. So how will we include all customer perspectives and you know, all, all kind of economic principles in this, how to balance expectations of the customers against all the customers, given what I just said. How can all customers clearly benefit from DR? And then what we'll do with, uh, for example, when it comes to import limits, because this is for exports. What happens with imports when all of us start having electric vehicles and we may have to curtail electric vehicle consumption, again, to, 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 to preserve network and system uh, integrity. Will we need the markets to do this? Can we do this by dynamic uh, network pricing? And how we somehow could reconcile the rights and responsibilities for the R, there will be more and more, the dynamic network limit framework, the economics of what is happening locally and what is happening in the market. And the fact that eventually, if we need to, to invest into more networks for DR, who is going to pay for that, given that also non-DR customers we pay, we have to pay for, um, for networks. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, uh, Pierluigi. Um, before you go, um, well, you, both of you would like to come up. <laughs> um, are there any clarification questions for Pierluigi? And any online? I can't access the question oh. stream. So, um, Or not? 
How do I just get rid of the, the screen up there? So I just want to be able to access the questions without everybody seeing all the questions. Uh, so I want to be able to access these questions, but not have them, the questions gone up on the screen. You can change this to blank so that people don't see what's okay. on the screen. Right. Right. Sorry, you haven't got any, any pretty pictures left at the moment. Um, what I want to do now is sort of take us into the discussion part. Um, can I ask you two to come up at the front, if that'd be all right? So we've got a um, we've got the best chance of everybody understanding it. And do we have roving mics? Yes? Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, great. I guess I, I, I kind of wanted to, I was asked to do sort of a very brief reflection. Um, Pier Luigi, I have one clarification question for you when you've got your mic. Okay, so if we stay at the uh, sort of level of the name and the individual, the fairness is in tension with the economic and technical, as I understand it. Yeah. But did you say that if there is some uh, local management of the system, then you can bridge that tension that, that you've currently got? Is yeah. that right? Um, it, it, partly, you, you, you can help, but uh, you would probably need uh, also some commercial arrangements to, to do that pro properly. And that is why I think it's essential to discuss this kind of social contract. Uh -huh. Because we may be in a situation where, for example, we, we, might, we might accept that if I am in a better position to inject power into a network, and this is beneficial for all the customers in the network, and niche can't, maybe niche, niche should be curtailed. I, I shouldn't because I'm in a better position, but then we should somehow find a way to share the benefits because he somehow allowed me to, yeah. to benefit from that. This kind of social contract at, at, the, at, at this level that does not exist. So we're trying to do something like this when we talk about energy communities, but it, it's it's very high level. If there's not a, 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 a framework to do this properly, and then of course this should be done eventually for all customers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I, I guess, you know, from a, um, a social science point of view, I, I think, Mainly what I've heard from you, um, and I, I, Nish, you, you looked at the different elements of fairness, but I think it's really important um, to think of, of fairness or justice perhaps in, in a number of different ways. I mean, one of them, I think, is what's called procedural fairness. So, so that how are you going to come up with a contract or whatever the policy instrument is, how are you going to come up with it so that people feel like they have been dealt with fairly? And that goes across the board, right? Um, I think then, thank you. Uh, I think then there is the distributional fairness that you've been talking about. And I think that is really important. Um, the third, however, is, is, is a term I really like, and that's uh, what Andrew Sayer calls contributive justice. We've had a policy environment in Australia where action on climate change, frankly, has been woeful. And so that many people, and particularly people with the resources, have said, I'm just going to take matters into my own hands, and at least I'll feel like I'm doing something. You know, you could argue that the amount of solar PV we've got in Australia is in part because of the lack of policy movement in the past. So now what we've got is a system where, where those with solar systems are creating additional problems, but it would be good, I think, to include some element of what you might call contributive justice in there. How do we both those with and without contribute to resolving the climate crisis and reducing uh, renewables and reducing carbon emissions that we've got. 
And so I guess one of my, my, my questions is, it's, the market's kind of constructed individuals and the system, but actually there's, there's a missing middle. You know, what are the levels of uh, distributed resources like community batteries or neighborhood scale batteries or uh, local councils getting involved or whatever, so that you've got not this kind of centralized system and then households, but you're actually bringing people together in a, a, a system of fairness. And so, you know, do you, do you, is that outside of your mandate, if you like, as, as in terms of the economic and, and, and technical side of the question? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, I don't know if Mark can talk about um, I, I think it's, I think it's a really good question. Um, there is a, there are trade-offs, there are several trade-offs between overall costs for all customers. And then, you know, as Bill Lee was talking about what happens on the individual level, I think it's, for me, it kind of traces back to um, traces back to that. Oh, there you go. Nice one. <laughs> <laughs> traces back to that when we started um, providing a feed-in tariff. When Germany started providing a feed-in tariff, it's like, oh, here's this thing that I can put on my roof and get paid for. There's nothing else in our lives almost that we can commodify in the same way. But now we're like, oh, this is the thing, and I've got this right for it. And I mean, maybe there's maybe there's a concept of the fair uh, fairness of allocation to that too. Uh, for me, I think a, a nice there's a couple of delineation points. One is um. Uh, I think it, it we can if we maximize self consumption. That's that for me feels like a natural fairness point. You know, I should be able to do what I want with my own stuff and my own house. Should be able to use my own thing. Uh, and then it's a real question: Well, what happens with the rest of it? If I've got some excess that I want to that I can give, uh, what happens there? And we've created this kind of market construct where it's all for profit. But uh, I think increasingly customers saying, "I'd like to be able to share with my." grandma or, you know people in my street or you know I should be able to community like shit put into a, a community battery and and share it with people in my neighborhood or or decrease costs for all people I've got this excess thing that I'd like to give it's not always my own profit it's not always to reduce my own bills like I, I, there's a concept that perhaps we could do something else with that excess I think for me there's a delineation between let's if, if we can kind of guarantee the fairness of our own stuff our own property um and recognizing that there's a whole bunch of uh, equity issues around renting and not owning your own property there yeah. too um then it's a question of what happens here uh one of the interesting things that came out of the workshop was that the neo the national electricity energy objective doesn't include any concept of equity but maybe that's something that could be thought about um how, how do we decrease costs for all customers including vulnerable customers there's a lot of people feeling mortgage stress and rental stress and cost of living is increasing and electricity bills are rising it's just, it's not a it's not a moot point i think it's um, something we should think about yeah, Luigi, yeah. No, I very much agree agree with yeah. Manish. We were very surprised actually when we started looking technically at this and actually, well, the neo actually that doesn't care about uh, or like, like the, the, this concept that they are, they are fundamental and somehow there is, I think, a shortcoming of uh, the regulatory environment that we have, yeah. particularly under, under this, uh, well, the, the current uh, economic situations. And I think uh, that again, look, looking back at the complexity that we found when we looked into trying yeah. to quantify this, this term, certainly there is really a need to collectively as an industry and I look at the regulators in particular to try to do more. And again, this idea yeah. of the social contract, really it's a call for the regulator to really take all of this much yeah. more seriously somehow yeah. that has been taken um, so, so far. Um, I also wanted to comment on uh, what, what you said before, about uh, that uh, somehow people feel uh, that because there was so much lack of action, yeah. so they want to do something, which is, yeah, which, which, which is great. And uh, at, at the same time, we can't uh, neglect the fact that uh, uh, they're still operating in a market. This would be the only somehow uh, environment where you make a decision, investment decisions, economic decisions, and somehow you would not like to have responsibilities because any any other decision that we make in terms yeah. of investment in economics somehow comes with some risk of responsibility. So I think, again, just looking at that from a commercial perspective, I, I think we'll see that there is a little bit of misalignment between the current situation and actually what it could be uh, like, like you know, to be more like what we, what we do in other, in other situations. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting comment in the sense that um, I, I looked at some of the Project AIDS reports and it was kind of interesting that people were saying that they were, they bought into solar systems and so on, thinking that they would not get a payback. And actually they got a payback much quicker than they expected. So their initial outlay was actually uh, what you might say is, is trying to help the planet. Yeah but they ended up actually benefiting economically. greatly economically than they had t anticipated. So now there's a, there's a kind of a, quite a switch and, and that, that has a very interesting social dynamics. Yeah. I exactly. think. Yeah. Yeah. So I just have one clarification question online. I, I missed. Um, so it's t directed to you, Pierluigi. This is an online um online question uh, from Nick Mason Smith. Dynamic network pricing was mentioned in your later slides, but as I understand previously, you were talking about dynamic envelopes engineering. Do we really need dynamic network pricing or markets or is engineering enough? E.g. a social contract where connecting a home battery involves an obligation to help out the network if the network is truly at risk of overload. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's a great question. The 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 answer is I don't think that uh, um, anybody's know anybody knows. That's why we are actually somehow testing different different options. Uh, it, it, there is a, as as always there is a, a spectrum of options. There is a, the kind of the engineering view of the problem where you would like to control everything. And uh, there is uh, somehow the market view where if actually you leave everything free for the market to decide and somehow also for the customers to decide. So somehow what, we try, what we've done so far is we try to engineer uh, as much as we could. Uh, but then now, of course, we recognize that we are more in a kind of market environment. We, we need to move forward. In between, somehow dynamic network pricing uh, sits. And yeah, we, we have to see what is eventually better for everyone. And this is not only an issue of what, what is better technically, economically, or socially. It also really depends on the kind of um, specific regulatory and institutional environment. So what we would think is best in Australia might not be best, for example, in the UK or you know, South America because of the institutional environment. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'd add something to that, Ben, just <laughs> quickly yeah. on dynamic network pricing. Um, so previously we used to have a solar hot water off, uh, off peak at night. To kind of shifted load to nighttime when electricity was low, then you could heat your water with um with electricity. Now we're having uh, solar sponge tariffs where it's electricity is really cheap during the middle of the day to kind of soak up that demand. Um, the kind of extension of that thought to dynamic network pricing is in some way like for everyone to be exposed to the spot price, but the the role of the retailer was to kind of manage those risks and hedge those risks and to provide you a stable cost of electricity. Um, that you could be able to, you know, plug in things and not have to pay too much. And I think most people, I'm like, I'm an energy nerd and I, I don't want to think about my bill too much, really. I don't want to turn my washing machine on a different type, whatever it might be, optimize my usage. Um, I, I think there's a question about how far we go down that road. I mean, there's a possibility that third-party aggregators might be able to provide that kind of service and, and control that stuff in the background. So that, so, sorry, third-party aggregators, yeah. like virtual power plants, yeah. kind of, is, that, is that the question? Yeah, or, yeah. Yep, or you have your air con and your, your pool pump and electric vehicle if you have one. Right. Um, kind of being controlled by a third party, which is uh, right. managing those costs according to dynamic network pricing. But there's yeah. a level yeah. in there. And there's a question whether there's enough kind of flat profit in the system for uh, you to be able to sell consumer stuff, the third party aggregator to make make money and for those benefits to be shared um, in an equitable way or an efficient way. It's a question whether there's enough there. Questions? One up at the back. Can you just wait for the mic, just for the online people? Otherwise, we they can't hear. <laughs> Is it switched on? Yeah, and calculated it at um, three gig one. Um, but my question is um, around uh, the and how it's often miscalculated. 
Rolling. Oh, I meant that rolling. Rolling is like the way that rolling. Rolling. Is that is that demand forecasting demand? Or... That, um, there may be a different. There may be a different in, difference in different terminology, terminology in Australia. Can maybe. you just explain? Yeah, a bit? yeah the, the excess that is produced from coal. You know, that's just sitting there waiting in case of maybe I've got the wrong term. Yeah, no, I know. There's it's a good question about we call it reserves. Um, we have yeah. various types of operating reserves. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's something that really needs to be managed too. There's active rule con change considerations at the moment in front of the market commission about how that happens. Um, you know, in South Australia, it's like a whole bunch of solar and we, all those gas plants and coal plants used to have some kind of reserve that was there to kind of buffer that system and provide some security um, there and reliability to, to come online if something happened. Uh, that's not there in the same way. Batteries coming online um, will help provide that. That's the Market Commission's current thinking is that it's probably going to be enough batteries and we should, don't have to worry about it too much. In some future, probably the amount of there's a whole bunch of curtailed renewables too. There's a lot of um, large-scale solar farms and wind farms being turned off when the prices are negative. So they'll provide some of that reserve too, but no, that's an ongoing question as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, mostly the calculations are way off. So it's it's always too much, that's what I understand. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. Actually, something at the operator, there's like the, the natural dynamic between, oh, the like operators being too conservative, how they're operating the system and uh, the, the kind of economics approach is like, hey, we should make it kind of raise the thin margins and, you know, just on the edge of the lights going off, there's a there's a trade-off there. My view is probably, uh, let's try to keep the lights on and, and have a bit of a buffer as we manage the transition. But no, I, I understand that there's uh, economic considerations. There too. Yeah, just just to be in, in fairness, I think that uh, the, the reserve market of Australia is probably the most efficient in the world because, I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible. If you look at South Australia, it's almost... It's really it's incredible how it is managed with their little operating operating reserve and the fact that you are able to technically well I mean this becomes technical but the co optimization you have of energy and uh, all the reserve markets in Australia is really the most advanced in the world so I I, I would not think that maybe in other in other situations the calculation of reserves may be way off but the way that the market has been designed in Australia is incredibly effective from that perspective. Any other questions? Maybe down the right there. Yep. My question is based in two parts. The initial idea, basically, that all this goodwill started off with basically people just putting solar power in. Reserve. Let's catch this uh, will. Let's catch this idea that basically most of us here in this room and most of us that put the panels on thought, yes, we're going to do this. We'll, there's going to be a terrific way of doing this. We're going to make, make sure that we're, we're independent and we can create this function from that. Let's catch these people before the big players come in, before the lobbyists come in, before the economics come in. I mean, you guys are talking about economics all the way down the line. I'm thinking, I'm not really interested in the economics. And the reason I'm not... And the reason you are, with all due respect, is basically because the economics is basically where it is. We didn't capture that basically that that groundswell that basically moved from that from there. I want to go back to that. It's exactly what you talked about, young, uh, with due respect, right? How we can capture that structure that was basically the great will that started that everybody put their their solar panels and said oh, we're going to do something terrific for the for the environment, and then all of a sudden it became something different. And as soon as the big players come in, guess what's going to happen? It's going to become even something even more different again. This is what I'm concerned about, right? Now, what I'm going to ask the panel is basically, is there a future for this? Or is there something that basically we have to basically work against the lobbyists that are going to do this? Thank you. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, there's large, there's large, I'm sorry. you know, <laughs> And I think it works in context. I mean, energy is a really valuable commodity. Uh, it's not no coincidence that I think it's like six out of the top ten companies in the world uh, for revenue are energy-based companies. It's a there's a large there's large interest at play here. Um, I know I think it's happening. I think people are doing it. I think people are putting panels on the roofs. And I, I pretty I reckon pretty sure most of us are going to be driving electric cars or sharing an electric car at some point. Um, I, I think you're right. I think. That goodwill has been commodified, yeah. commoditized yeah. in some kind of way, and and maybe there's a reset of that, rethinking of that. Um, and I think you know, uh, people like Pierre, Luigi, and the team. I think we can kind of, people at the operator, 
we can manage the system according to what, what kind of values we put into it. Um, but there isn't, I think we could have more of a conversation about what values we put into it and what things we'd like to optimize. And I think we can go away and do it. Networks, I think networks are crying out for some certainty. So how should, please let us know how we should do it. Yeah. Because the, the status quo is that there are, um, there are inefficiencies and there are large and growing cross subsidies from people without two people that do. And that's unfair, but it, I, I think there is some will yeah. here and it, it start, the conversation is starting and growing. It would let us like, yes, let, let's go, instead of, instead of an inflated driving, let's, let's, let's us then, as part of community drive it because nobody knows what it's going to go. Nobody knows what it's going to go. Let's make it next step. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so so just uh, let me, uh, I want to respond to just, just to be very clear that we, we talk about economics, uh, um, I'm not talking about the economics of any big player or, or establishment, actually talking about the economics of all the people in the room who do not have uh, a rooftop PV. Because what I showed is uh, that effectively what you want to do is uh, try to maximize efficiency of the use uh, of rooftop PV that the people would have invested in exactly to reduce the prices for everyone. Yeah. So the better yeah. we understand how to do this, the better it is for the economics of everyone. So I'm, I'm going exactly in your direction, yeah. certainly not in the direction of the, of the establishment. So I talk about economics because I care or lowering the bills of everyone, not because I care on making the retailers richer. Yeah. Of the that's Wonderful, but, but but can I say something else? Yeah, sure. My main concern as a professor of power systems is the fact, uh, and I need to make sure that uh, everyone understands in the public that what the system operator does uh, when you say, well, I'm curtailing PV in South Australia as an island, or oh, why are you doing this? Certainly you can do something else. Well, no, can't, they can't do anything else because otherwise they would do it. And uh, if they if they don't do that, and then next there is a blackout, then there is a, there will be terrible for everyone. Now this kind of message doesn't really come across uh, the, yeah. the the public at all. There is like this kind of uh, a conspiracy theory, like system operator or network operators hate customers with PV, therefore they can tell it. It is it, not that actually this is in the interest of system security exactly to prevent then major very bad outcomes like yeah, systems like the, ARCH. The, 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 the it is not a mismanagement, it's perfect management with the resources that you have. It's, it's basically, that, that structure has to be basically dealt with before it actually occurs on, on the uh, oh, Yeah, exactly. And, and that is yeah. that is the only thing that engineers can do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question here and then I'll go to some questions online. So, oh, sorry, was there somebody else first? Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Um, so really good, really interesting presentations because I think what you're establishing is the complexity of the problem that we face that is social, spatial, technical, economic, and I would add cultural to it as well. Um, you've also made the point that there are these, what you call unfair, although I question a bit how we're using this terminology, but, but there are these redistributions occurring that do seem inequitable, but it's also important to understand that the system, the pre-existing system is just riddled with cross subsidies and cost reallocations many of which are not that clear, but perhaps the most important one for a state spatially extensive um, place like Australia is uniform pricing that makes high cost to serve customers in remote regional rural areas um, pay a similar amount to those in, in areas of high demand. And it's really hard to imagine how we go from where we are now to where we need to be in a, in a much more decentralized DER future um, in a way that brings everyone along and doesn't produce these kinds of, of, of conflicts. And so that's really my question. How, how do we do this? And, and it's just a comment that I think the way in which the dominant way of presenting a lot of this is still very techno-economic. 
and it's based on understanding consumers as in terms of their property rights um, and in terms of their load, but actually not understanding how households and communities are embedded both socially and spatially. So I guess one of the things I'm interested in is how we can really start with high cost to serve communities. And if we can develop solutions that harness their local DR in a way that distributes benefits more broadly, but also um, realizes value in both the commercial but a non-commercial sense, yeah. um, I think we're on a pathway to doing this better. Um, and Pierluigi, as you know, a lot of the barriers of, as we see it, are really regulatory in achieving that. But there are also there's also organizational cultural issues within the sector. So I guess just there are a couple of comments, but my question is really like, what is the process for getting there? What are the forms of conversation and dialogue and engagement um, where there's kind of knowledge, humility amongst all the players, and this includes the community that can really take this forwards? Before anybody answers that, we have three minutes and I have three questions online and the discussion is just hopping up and it always happens. So hold on to that thought. I'm going to read a couple of the questions here and then I'll give you both an opportunity for a final comment. The first I think is, is, is fairly straightforward um, and that is, Will there need to be more controls required at the smart meters end? So in other words, how much can smart meters be part of the solution here? Um, the second is, does a hyper-local net market for network services make sense conceptually? So, so sort of scaling down this, this sort of interim space between the individual and the market. It's a longer question, but I'm going to leave it there because of time. And the third is, Shouldn't we just let the people who already have solar be okay, but just curtail future connections? So in, that's the final question here. Well, 10, 10 seconds, I can respond. Yes, yes, no. <laughs> yes, yes, no. And, and Sangita's question? Sangita's question, uh, I think uh, the, uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to bring more, at the same time, quantitative analysis and the kind of deep, uh, institutional discussions and and obviously you know exactly what what I mean there I think there's lots of quantitative analysis that is missing yeah just quickly uh that last one uh first in best dress doesn't always seem qu quite fair to me um this question I think um but to Sangeetha's point I, no, I really appreciate the conversation I think it's I mean, they're the right questions uh looking at this there's a whole spectrum of ways to address this um, ranging from structural reform, let's change the neo, let's, you know, post-capitalism, let's, you know, renationalize the grid. There's all these kind of considerations on this end and there's, let, you know, let's change this standard and fix our smart meters. And there's a, there's a kind of whole spectrum. Um, I think as, as people, as citizens, we can kind of like swing for which kind of one. There's a risk of action versus inaction and chances of success. Um, I think we can, I think we should take steps um, on, on all fronts uh, where we think that the reward is, is likely to be um, the the work that we've done here is is more on the working mostly within the uh, regulatory system that we have. What are some of the steps that we can do? You know, while the next two gigawatts, three gigawatts of rooftop solar is added year on year on year. But no, I think you're certainly right. These kind of structural questions of fairness and consideration and spatial awareness, and um, I think that's really where the conversation has to be. It's a longer conversation, harder to take steps. But mm -hmm. but if we don't start, then we then we won't do it at all. We'll just do these instrumental stuff. But yeah. What's to do? Great. Well, will you join with me in thanking our two speakers very much? Thank you. And many, many thanks to you for coming and for joining the, the discussion that was just hotting up. But our time is done, so I wish you a very good night. Thank you.